Thanks, Moshe. Thanks a lot for uh, for having me in this seminar. It's, uh, it's great to be in Israel for the day. Uh, so this is um, this is a joint work with Inkai Lee, Liren Shan, and Yifan Wu, uh, who are uh, fantastic PhD students at Northwestern University. Uh, Inkai Lee is, is going to be a postdoc uh, at Yale with Dirk Bergerman and Yang Tsai uh, next year. Uh, and this is something, uh, a project that we started a few years back uh, and uh, prompted by uh, a failure of the standard proper scoring rules to be useful in a setting I cared about a lot at the time and still do actually, which is peer grading. Um, cool, so I, I'm gonna be talking about uh, incentivizing effort in, uh, in with proper scoring rules. And I just wanna give you a quick example of uh, scoring rules to remind you if you haven't seen them in a bit. Um, so a peer might, uh, I'm going to use peer grading as, as my example too. So a peer might uh, review a submission and they might have a belief over uh, what grade the TA might assign the submission. And I'll call that uh, the zero one uh, random uh, uh, belief. Uh, and then the TA uh, is going to review the submission and they are going to uncover the true state, the true uh, grade that should be assigned the submission. Uh, and then we want to evaluate whether the peers review is any good or not. Uh, uh, because if you don't assign any work in your class, you realize you have to grade all the work you assign. So you better be grading the grading. Uh, and one way to do that is to use the scoring rule. And so the one of the canonical ones is the quadratic scoring rule. Uh, and so I'm going to take the peers report and I'm going to take the TA's uh, grade and I'm going to compare them and I, I basically calculate how many points I deduct from the peer based on the square distance between the TA's report and the, the peer's report. Um, convenient, for convenience, I'm gonna be normalizing all the reports to be zero, one. Um, so great, so I could do this. Um, actually, I don't recommend ever doing this. It's a horrible idea, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, okay, so um, I wanna talk about why optimize scoring rules. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, I guess the first motivation is that if you try doing the standard things, uh, you're going to be a little bit sad, uh, uh, especially in this example application I have. Um, and I think uh, there's been a, you know, outside of outside of the times when I'm sad, I, I've noticed that other times people use scoring rules, they often end up being sad. Uh, and one of those examples is the in the um, you know, mechan mechanical turkey experiments when people try to elicit uh, behavior and they use incentives, they notice that the turkers don't really respond that much. I think it's, it's part of the same story. Um, uh, I, I've been in the last five years uh, in part due to my interest in peer grading, been very interested in incentives in the classroom. And uh, I think it's actually a really fantastic uh, opportunity for people interested in algorithmic game theory to think about applying ideas like mechanism design. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think it's such a great uh, opportunity is that unlike many of the you know, uh, industry leading applications, uh, you really do get an opportunity to design these mechanisms pretty much every time you teach your class. You can change the rules around, try to figure out what, what makes the incentives better. Uh, and so I think this, this domain is, is, and there are a lot of really nice questions that look a lot very similar to the questions we've been looking at for a couple decades. And so I think that uh, I'm really excited about this area. Um, and the, the last thing is, uh, <laughs> You know, now that I've done some work in optimizing scoring rules, everywhere I look, I see questions that look a lot like the optimizing scoring rule question. Um, and that's uh, because of the revelation principle. So if, if you have any uh, situation where uh, your agents might put in effort and then get some payoff from the you know, actions based on that effort, uh, that's like apply the revelation principle and you've got uh, a scoring rule basically because uh, they, get, they put in effort, they have beliefs, uh, and then they act according to their beliefs. And so the environment is basically a scoring rule for their beliefs. 
And so in some sense, like almost any mechanism looks, starts to look like a scoring rule uh, with this perspective. And so um, this is somehow is like underneath like a lot of what we think about. Um, cool. So <laughs> why, why is the quadratic scoring rule so horrible? So I, um, I, I did do this in my class and, and ever after I've, I've thought really bad about it. Um, so if you imagine the ground truth grade is something between 0.6 and 1, which is sort of what happens at Northwestern. Uh, students don't like getting below 60s uh, uh, percent, and uh, they can't get up more than 100%. Um, and then consider someone who doesn't even look at the submission at all and just decide, I'm just going to say uh, 80%. Okay, well, look, quadratic scoring rule. Okay, so the difference is 0.2. You square that, it's 0 0.04. Um, and so everyone's getting at least a 96% on this assignment. Uh, okay, so you get a 96% with no effort at all. Why would anyone ever put in effort? Okay, so this is <laughs> obviously not going to work. And so this is uh, this really, this example motivated us to think about uh, how do we get, you know, there are two things wrong, right? Uh, you know, I, I can't really tell good reports from bad reports because everything is in such a tiny range. Uh, and also, why would anyone bother even, even looking at things? And so this is really what I noticed in the, in the first couple of years. Jason, of running Jason, rules. Jason, if I may yes, tell please. up, but that's please. not fair. It's just because you did one minus and you, you put a scale at one. Uh, maybe relative to 0 0.04, you can do something better. The right scale is not one minus that. The one minus is arbitrary. And now uh, you say, a, well, relative to 0.96, I mean, the improvement is small, right? Because you chose that one arbitrarily. If instead of one minus, you just put minus that and you want to minimize it, I mean, 0 0.04 and 0 0.01, there is a 400% difference. I'd say it's a great comment. So um, if I'm going to think sensibly about the question about optimizing scoring rules, I better have some constraints on what scores I'm allowed to produce. And so for a classroom environment, it's very natural to assume that you can't assign people negative scores and you can't assign people scores above 100%. Uh, and then you end up stuck in this environment where I'm choosing a score between zero and one. Uh, and if I want to always choose a score between zero and one, and I'm gonna use the quadratic rule, this is what I'm doing. Okay, this is actually the, the quadratic scoring rule with the most uh, incentive if I'm required to be between zero and one, when I know that the state is between zero and one. Cool, so um, I wanna just give you a, a hint at some of the main things we're gonna accomplish towards the, uh, towards the end of, of this seminar. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about multi-dimensional scoring rules uh, a lot and, uh, there are a couple applications you can think about. You can think about this in peer review where a peer looks at a submission and then there's a multi-dimensional rubric with different properties of the submission. And on reading it, you instant it, you, you on putting in effort, you sort of know uh, which of these uh, properties a submission satisfies and which it doesn't satisfy. Um, and that, that would be one application. Another application I quite like is uh, exam grading. So the students put in a bunch of effort to study for my, my exam, uh, and then I ask them a bunch of questions. And so they have a multidimensional uh, belief about what they're getting on those, uh, you know, what the answers are for those questions based on their studying. Um, and so what we're going to be showing you is uh, there's a pretty good uh, a, a simple intuition uh, for a good scoring rule, which is maximum over separate. In other words, uh, we have this, the, the forecaster report, uh, their belief on every, each dimension, but then we score them according to a single dimensional rule, which is the single dimensional rule for the coordinate that maximizes their score. Okay, so we sort of reward them for the, the most revealing, uh, or and uh, one way I like to think about it is most surprising uh, thing that happens. Okay, so they do effort, they uncover something surprising, they, uh, we reward them on what is surprising for them. Okay, and the thing that you probably would have done if you 
hadn't thought about how to optimize scoring rules beforehand is something like average over separate. If you if you run an exam, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you uh, score people by averaging up the grades on each part uh, or summing the grades on each part, which is basically uh, average of separate scoring rules. Uh, and, and this actually can be as bad as a linear approximation. Cool. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a framework for optimizing scoring rules uh, with binary effort. Uh, and we'll look at, uh, we'll take a brief detour uh, through single dimensional scoring rules. Um, but most of the, our, our main interest here is on uh, uh, multi-dimensional scoring rules. Um, and we'll talk about how some of the standard scoring rules uh, in the literature that everyone uses are, are suboptimal uh, for this objective, uh, in fact, far from optimal. Um, cool. So uh, what I would like to optimize is the incentive for effort. Okay, so if, some, if someone has a, a prior belief over some random state and they put in effort, uh, this effort uh, will give them a signal which they can refine their belief and get a, uh, a posterior distribution. And what I'd like to do is maximize the expected gain uh, between the belief which is the prior and the belief which is the posterior. Okay, so let's just um, write down some of the math that we're gonna be using. So we'll have a state space which I'll call theta, uh, and there's going to be a prior distribution d. Uh, I'm going to be restricting attention to, to uh, eliciting the mean in this talk. Uh, however, many of these ideas uh, are going to be, uh, general. you can generalize these ideas to eliciting uh, the full distribution if you want. Uh, one way to think about that is that the, if you have a full distribution, then uh, you can think about eliciting the mean on the indicator variables for each state that appears. Um, and the agent's uh, action space is gonna be binary. They'll either put in effort uh, or not put in effort. If they have no effort, then their belief is the prior D. If they put in effort, uh, their belief will be a posterior I'll call G. Uh, and because I'm gonna look at uh, distributions for uh, for reporting the mean, uh, I'll let f be a density over the posterior mean. Okay, and so if the agent puts in effort, they get a draw from all the possible posterior distributions uh, that they could realize from a signal that they got about the state. Okay, and so, um, we will draw uh, from the agent's perspective uh, after they realize their posterior, we draw a state from the posterior uh, and uh, they will get a report and they'll get scored uh, based on a scoring rule. Okay, so as you are probably aware, uh, a scoring rule is proper if it satisfies the following inequality uh, for any distribution G and any report you wanna make, uh, reporting the, the mean for that distribution uh, gives you higher score than reporting uh, any other uh, report. Okay, so we're trying to maximize the gain from effort. So we'll look at this max over scoring rules, the expected gain from effort such that the scoring rule is proper. Um, and you can ob obviously arbitrarily score, uh, scale scoring rules. So we want to normalize them to be in some boundary range. Okay, this, um, there, you know, there are, are two most obvious ways to normalize the distribution. One is a ex post range, which is very useful in classroom environments where you don't want to assign students grades above 100 or below zero. Um, and the other normalization would be a constraint on the expectation, uh, which might be more relevant in uh, the crowdsourcing applications, uh, but they give similar math. Cool, so that's a framework for optimizing scoring rules. Um, and so looking at this- just a, um, just a, a, quick, a quick question. Are you formally uh, model the effort cost? 
Do you formally model the effort cost? No, we're not going to formally model the effort cost. Um, and one way that you can think about the effort is if suppose the cost of effort is drawn from a distribution, then by maximizing the incentive for effort, you maximize the number of people who put in effort because it'll just be a threshold. The people above with cost uh, below some amount will put in effort, people above it won't if you maximize the effort, uh, the incentive for effort. Thanks. Thanks. Now, uh, Jason, when you say posterior G, you mean it's a distribution over distributions over D, over theta, sorry, over theta, so that that average is the prior. Is that what you mean by posterior G? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and so you can think about this as, you know, there is a prior, you get some signal, you refine your uh, prior to get a posterior, uh, but writing that down is sort of unhelpful. So we just assume that we have a distribution G, um, which uh, 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 is uh, the same as the prior taken in expectation. Yeah, right. And there is only one G possible. I mean, there is only one possible posterior distribution. I mean, a actually, G in the sense, I mean, you cannot choose whether from the prior correct. you get to this, that's correct. have this posterior, have that, or one serve that and two serves that. That's not a choice. There's just exactly. one possible posterior. So either you exactly. take it or don't. Correct? Exactly. And so, so actually, if you okay. look at this expectation here that I have in this formula, I'm first going to draw G from this F, and F is the prior over priors. Uh, actually, F is the prior over posteriors. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to draw theta from G, which is the agent's perspective. So they believe that once they draw G from this, if they put an effort, once they draw G from F, right, then they're going to think of the state as coming from G. OK, so the agent's objective is, and, and again, I'm restricting attention to scoring rules for eliciting the mean. So the agent's object, uh, if, if they just do no work, their, their belief about the mean is, is the, the prior mean. So they get a score according to reporting the prior mean. OK? And if they actually put an effort, they'll get a score according to the mean of the posterior G. And so that expected difference is the incentive for effort. OK, and of course, you want this, uh, this scoring rule to be proper for eliciting the mean. Uh, and we're going to want it to be bounded. OK, so for all reports and states, uh, we don't produce a score outside the range 0, 1. Cool, uh, so, so that's our uh, So one question. So uh, are you saying, uh, are you arguing that at least thing the mean is, is uh, like, is enough? I mean, mm -mm. If... no, actually. And um, uh, we uh, initially restricted to the mean because we very much cared about this peer grading application. And we thought it was too complicated to ask people for full distributions over uh, the numbers between zero and one. Uh, uh, and so we wanted a simpler report space. And so that's why we ended up thinking about the mean. But as I said before, uh, one way to think about general distributions is to just imagine the indicator for every state that could be realized. And then you just have a multidimensional scoring rule uh, uh, where the probability that state shows up is, uh, is each where each indicator variable is differently. OK, so then. <laughs> the mean is the distribution. Uh, Jason? Yes, please. Uh, you might have said that already, but uh, can you please explain again, why is this your objective function? What type of, of, of objective, why, why, why would you like to maximize this difference, yeah. this incentive for effort? Yeah, so I'm imagining uh, you know, one of the students in my class is, is thinking, gee, I'd really like to hang out with my friends this weekend, but I got assigned by this horrible professor to do this peer grading. And, you know, what's it going to change my grade to actually put an effort and do this peer grading? Or should I just report, you know, what the class average instead? Okay, so they can always just show up and report the class average. And that's this, this term over here. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, that's what they would get from reporting the mean. And if they actually put in effort, they'll see a signal about the this, what they're grading, and they'll be able to refine their belief over the class average. Ah, this is a sort of one of the better students in the class. They did a pretty good job with this. Or ah, it's one of the worst students. Uh, this is a big yeah, mess. I can't even read this. Yeah, but that's objective function is more from the agent's perspective. I would expect to have the principal's. Um, perspective here. Uh, so perhaps the principal has some utility from from effort that agents are maybe maybe it's not worth at all that agents exert effort in terms of my my economy. Yeah, uh, yeah. This yeah. Way you are so, catching the maximum number of agents. So assuming different agents have different effort that they can invest and this the, this maximizer catches the most agents. In your class, I mean, if you have, you know, those those for which the effort is very costly probably will not do it, but you are getting uh, up to a cutoff that is as high as possible. I agree with Sergio. I'm, I'm maximizing the number of agents that want to put in effort because I think that putting in effort is how students learn, and I like learning. Okay, and yeah, so I think that. Um, Maybe you are excited about peer grading and you think that what I want to do with the peer reports is aggregate them and give people grades. Uh, that is uh, a very secondary concern, actually, it turns out. That's actually really easy to do. Um, and what I really need to have happen to make things all work is that students actually just read the submissions and put in effort. Um, and my perspective on that is that as a uh, as an instructor who assigns students to do work, I don't assign students to do work that I don't think uh, uh, benefits their learning. And what I need them to do to learn is to put in effort. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now that's a it's a good question, but um, really this is the hardest the hardest part about getting peer grading to work is getting students to put in effort on on actually doing a good job. For example. Jason, why, why do you think like just grading is easy? Like at scale, say in Coursera scale, is grading still easy? Uh, yeah, I think grading is still easy. Uh, my experience uh, running this, even with <laughs> even with a really bad scoring rule, was that uh, was that. Uh, and and the way I I measured this is in the peer grading system that we built. Uh, is I had an appeal that was worth 5%. If you didn't like your grade, you could appeal it for any reason. And the appeal rate was super low, which means people were really happy with their grades. The appeal rate was less than, uh, I guess, 3%. But if I give everybody 100, they will have an appeal. It doesn't have any That's signal. not going to work well in these scoring rules if you give everybody 100, because the TA is not going to give everybody 100. You're going to get marked down from that. It's the hope. Okay, again, so giving everyone a hundred, that's uh that's a report that doesn't depend on the on the distribution, right? Uh, on your posterior. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, giving people a hundred is worse than than reporting the prior mean. You'd rather yeah. give people an eight just, just or whatever the class to this, is. Just referring to the appeals. They will never appeal. That's it. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> the I mean Giving everybody 100 is not proper. I mean, literally, it's not proper. <laughs> Again, I'm finding myself agreeing with Sergio. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, exactly. And the, the point is, is that uh, the students might, I mean, the students might think that if we just all give everyone 100, it'll be this great situation where no one has to do any work in the class and no one learns anything, and that's awesome. Um, uh, but in practice, each peer is getting compared to the uh, getting graded by the TA, and and so that's a dominated strategy for them. Um, but as I showed you in my first example, like it's not that dominated, right? Um, uh, and that was like really the problem. And so we want to make it as dominated as possible by making the incentive for effort higher. And you can think about this. Incentive is effort uh, as also is just sort of quantifying, um, you know, having information versus not having information. So you, you, you know, having the posterior signal versus not having the posterior signal. Like how much better is it to have the posterior signal? 
right? And in environments where I can really separate these two out, uh, uh, <laughs> these are great environments where we actually see that the signal is really worthwhile for the objective that the agents have. And that's why we're sort of focusing on this binary case of just really separating these two um, these, these two situations of effort and no effort. Cool. Um, so uh, here's here's my agenda. Um, I'm going to review some basics of, of scoring rules. It's going to look really familiar for those of you who love mechanism design. Uh, then we'll uh, quickly talk about single dimensional scoring rules, which will be pretty easy to, to think about. Uh, and then uh, jump, jump into the main result, which is the multidimensional case. Um, OK, so here's a characterization of proper scoring rules, which, I, uh, which, which you all should love. Um, so a scoring rule is proper and bounded in 0, 1 uh, if it induces a convex utility function for the agent uh, and the subgradients of this convex utility function uh, satisfy this boundedness property. OK, and so these. Um, this should look familiar uh, because this is very similar to what uh, is in Rocher's characterization of multidimensional scoring rules. Um, but in fact, the scoring rule version of this uh, predated Rocher, uh, McCarthy in, in 56, uh, had this basic formulation. Uh, and the uh, and Abernathy and uh, Frangillo uh, generalized this or, or wrote the, the version of this that was uh, for incentivizing the mean. Uh, McCarthy's version was for uh, general distributions, general report spaces. Okay, so I just want to uh, draw a little picture about what we're, so, what we're thinking so what about is, here. Sorry, what is S in this formulation? S is the scoring rule. S, S is really this, this expression? U uh, minus so U S, minus C. S is the scoring rule. It maps the report R and a th state theta. Okay, however, the state theta is drawn from a distribution which we know. No, but what so we is can take S expectations. Of R theta, the functional form of S R theta. That's what I'm asking. I'm going to get to that in the next slide. If you can hold oh. off for a second. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's for let's for a second let's take the revelation principle. And so you give a people a scoring rule. They behave in some way, and so that induces some utility function, which is a function of uh, their report and a function of the uh, the theta that they get, uh, the theta that's observed. OK, um, and uh, this theorem says that any proper scoring rule you could view as inducing uh, this convex utility function. Uh, and uh, the thing that you care about for the boundedness of scoring rule is going to be the subgradients uh, of that utility function. And so let's just um, let's just look at this uh, this uh, depiction. Uh, so if I have a convex utility function, you imagine a binary state, or sorry, not a binary state, but imagine my zero one single dimensional uh, uh, state space. Um, and so essentially what it's like is when you when you make a report, you're picking which subgradient you want to be evaluated on. And then when the state is realized, we're evaluating the difference between uh, the state on your subgradient versus the state on the utility function. OK, and so it's basically, and if you are familiar with the Bregman divergence, this is the definition of Bregman divergence as well. Um, and so um, uh, a scoring rule is proper uh, if it if it's can be viewed as the Bregman divergence of, uh, of a function. OK, and then um, the boundedness. Uh, is just how far apart can these the subgradient be from the utility function, and so boundedness basically is just evaluating the extreme points. And so you just look at either side, you look at the slope of the utility function at one side, and you look at where uh, you know how far apart those two points are. And so the um, boundedness constraint basically just says that this this blue line and the opposite blue line on the other side uh, has to be at most one. Cool. 
and another thing you'll notice here is that I'll, I'll typically look at utility functions where the prior mean is the, the bottom most point. And if you think about it, that's the point where you have no new information. You basically, you put an effort, but you didn't get any new information. And so you're gonna get the same as if you had nothing, which we normalize to zero. Okay, so this, um, so this characterization of inducing a utility function suggests that why don't we just define scoring rules in terms of the utility function themselves. So I'll define uh, canonical scoring rules for the mean. Um, and we'll be looking at a convex utility function mapping the report space to the real numbers. Uh, and we'll be looking at its subgradients. Uh, and then we're gonna have to uh, introduce a normalization variable to make sure that the resulting function is between zero and one. Okay, and so then we can, this is what Sergio was asking me for. Uh, then you can define the scoring rule uh, in this way. Okay, so, and because all scoring rules eventually look like this when yeah, you- Yeah, the dimension N is what here? What is N, small N? Uh, so if you imagine the report space was multi-dimensional, uh, the state space is multi-dimensional, then the report space oh, would also uh, be multi-dimensional. It's zero, one to the power N, that's a state space. Yes, it's for example. Okay. okay. Yeah, so imagine the state space is zero, one to the power N, and then the report space is also zero, one to the power N if you want to report the means, or the multi-dimensional mean. Uh, and then, exactly, thank you, Sergio. Uh, cool, and once you, um, once you have this formulation, you'll realize that if you draw the state theta from this distribution G, um, then a lot of things sort of shake out in the expectation um, because uh, uh, this, um, you believe, if you believe that, uh, if your report is actually truly drawn from the distribution, then you believe that the expectation of theta minus your report is zero. Okay, so this middle term entirely drops out when we calculate utilities. And uh, the normalization function kappa has nothing to do with your report. So it also is gonna drop out of your expectation. And so the objective um, uh, can be uh, simplified to just, um, just integrating this utility function uh, in expectation uh, according to the density of the posterior means minus the utility function at the prior mean. Okay, and that's because both of them have the expectation of kappa in them, so that cancels out a positive and negative term. And because, uh, you know, if you truthfully report, then uh, this middle term uh, is gonna be zero because uh, the definition of truth reporting is that the theta minus R is zero in expectation. And that's a linear function. Okay, again, here's my geometric interpretation uh, with kappa omitted. Um, so if you make a report, you're choosing a subgrading to be evaluated on. Uh, and then when the state is realized, I look at how far your subgradient is from the utility function. And that's your score. Now the function K is arbitrary, right? And you play with it in order to get to your bounds? Yeah, so I, again, to get as I said- the right bounds that you want? On the previous slide, I said that, um, it, yeah, it's for the boundedness constraint. I want the score to be between zero and one at the end of the day. And so I set K so that when I have either of the extreme, uh, like any, either of the extreme will score is that the whole thing is between zero and one. And so it's just a normalization constraint to get things to add up at the, at the end and satisfy the boundedness constraint. Cool. So let's do, um, so that's, that's sort of the basics. Let's, uh, let's do the, the easy step of thinking about single dimensional scoring rules. Okay, so um, here's my objective again. I'm trying to maximize the expectation of the posterior mean minus the prior mean. Um, 
and I'll define a utility function to be V-shaped uh, if, well, if it looks like a V, it's the it's uh, two lines that come together at a point at the prior mean. And, and here's the observation. Uh, my objective is the expected posterior mean minus the prior mean. So if I have a V-shaped utility function where the point of the V is exactly at the prior mean, then I haven't changed the prior mean utility. Um, but the utility everywhere else is increased. So this expected difference uh, only increases by making it V-shaped. So if I started out with a not V-shaped rule, I could make it V-shaped and only improve the objective function. Okay, and then the other observation is that this not only does it only improve the objective function, but it also only makes the, the boundedness constraint weaker. Because remember the boundedness constraint came from the slope at the point evaluated at the, at the far side, right? And that was the difference between, um, you know, when I make a tangent line at zero and I evaluate that at one versus U of one, that difference versus the other side difference. Okay, and if I make this change, I make the tangents, uh, the, the slopes uh, shallower. Uh, and so the boundedness constraint becomes less binding. So this satisfies, if I satisfied the boundedness constraint before, I, I'm still satisfying it. Okay, and so you get the uh, straightforward result that the optimal single dimensional scoring rule is V-shaped uh, and uh, the mean is uh, at, the, at the mean of the prior. Cool, and actually, um, this should be expected. It uh, should be prior, prior, right? Not posterior. It's the same thing because of uh, right. The if so, remember, uh, little f is the distribution over posterior means, and it better be that the distribution over posterior means the mean of that is equal to the prior mean. Okay, so the mean of posterior means is equal to the prior mean. Yeah. Uh, but okay. good point. <laughs> I wanted to say that. The expectation so of the asking. posterior is the prior. That's true overall for anything in particular. Take the expectation of that. That's, of course, true. Yes. Cool. And so um, this has a, a sort of nice interpretation. Uh, you're just asking the agent to choose the left or the right. Okay, uh, you want to know is the are we to the left of the mean or to the right of the mean? Uh, and that's that's the question we want to ask the agent to maximize their effort. So, by the way, which v function that just comes from your bound, right? You are going to choose those things so that the maximum difference at one of the two ends is bounded by your range, right? That's uh, that's what will dictate uh, what slopes you have. Yeah. So is the, that correct? The, the input exactly. That's exactly right. So the input is just where is the where is mu d, right? Once you have like yeah. you know if you know zero one, then it's like where is mu d, and like okay, you. Uh, that's the only thing you care about, um, and actually that's a this is a great point to bring up. Uh, notice that the g doesn't matter. G doesn't matter. It, g it's does, uniform for actually, all g's. What doesn't matter is the distribution over g's, which is f. Right. So that's, little f doesn't what, matter. Yeah. The only yeah, thing that matters point. is the distribution over the prior mean of uh, where the prior mean is. And so actually, I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, but in the, in the paper, we've got a sample complexity result based on this idea, which says that once you get a good enough estimate uh, from samples of the prior mean, that's all you need to know to actually design a good scoring rule. Uh, and for my peer grading application, we don't even care about that because you know, maybe we <laughs> set the mean to be 80%, which is what we should expect in a class. Cool. So let's um, talk about the quadratic scoring rule. So so, qu sorry, I'm, but there are many, sorry, I'm still, uh, after I said something, I think I was wrong. Uh, there are many V-shaped for which you'll have the same bound. No? They'll give the same so, objective too. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be many scoring rules that give you the same objective as well. 
So you claim they are equivalent in terms of behavior. They're equivalent in terms of incentive for effort. Yeah, so they induce behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. And in fact, they're even more than that because I'm, you know, it's writing this for canonical scoring rules, but when you actually go and implement it, you can choose anything that induces the same canonical scoring rule. So there are actually lots and lots of scoring rules that would do this. Um, but the interpretation of just choose left or right, uh, I think is sort of a nice way to think about it. I actually really like indirect scoring rules. I think they're you know much simpler to think about than the direct ones. Cool, so let's look at quadratic scoring rules. So again, the quadratic scoring rule, um, and uh, typically in quadratic, you look at uh, you know incentivizing with a cost, uh, but I like to have positive benefits. So we'll give the agent a dollar and then subtract off how far they are from the mean squared, uh, for, from the true state squared. Um, and uh, if you wanna map this into, uh, the canonical framework, then this is going to choose the utility function as r squared, and kappa of theta is going to be 1 minus theta squared. So you'll see that's where the normalization is coming in to make things 0, 1 bounded. OK, um, and so here's an example. So imagine... way, since you are looking at differences, you're looking at the differences of scores, one after under d and one after uh, s under g. Which means that the constant one minus one, the one doesn't really matter, it cancels out. So all this normalization business somehow looks like a little bit of a red herring. You are looking after all at S minus S, right? So instead of one, I could put a hundred, I'll get exactly the same thing, or I'll put zero, it's the same. So somehow, exactly. somehow all this boundedness now sounds a little uh, No, strange. boundedness makes a lot boundedness is important, and what matters is the difference in the upper and lower bound. Okay, so if I have one unit in which I can vary this between the smallest score and the biggest score, that's what matters. Okay, and so we just normalize how much it yeah, matters. See, suppose one. I, if I, I know that UD is at say 0 0.6 or whatever, 0 0.8 you wanted, well, that gives me a bound. So instead of putting that, I can do one minus 10 times theta minus r squared, I'm still going to be between zero and one, but I increase yeah. incentives tenfold, which means I'm capturing much more. Yeah, so that's so not if, going to be the right answer. If uh, so, here's the here's what you're saying, I think, and you can tell me if I, I got you right. So if I okay. know that all the grades are going to be between between be between 0.6 and one, then I should have designed a scoring rule for that state space and not the zero one state space, and that could have gotten me a better outcome. Um, I'm a little reluctant to do that because maybe sometimes, rarely, someone really fails it and gets below 0.6. Um, but you're right. Allowing someone to really fail it and get below 0.6 is really sort of hurting me in the objective. So maybe uh, doing that differently is a good idea. The thing is, is that the range really actually ends up being important. You can't just truncate it because that breaks the preferness. Uh, so. Anyway, I think it's a good question. Uh, I'm glad you're interested in it. Let me um, let me give you. So I get a good score. Yes. I appreciate yeah, you putting like, a lot mind. of effort never to mind. this uh, talk. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So let's uh, consider the following distribution over over uh, posteriors. Uh, so it's going to be uniform on two states. Uh, one half minus epsilon and one half plus epsilon. Okay, and for me, since we're reporting the expectation and the distribution doesn't matter given the expectation, we just assume that the state is, is one half minus epsilon or one half plus epsilon, it's the same thing. Okay, um, so if I were to put this into my framework for optimizing scoring rules, I'd, I'd see that the optimal objective is, is epsilon. Okay, because, you know, look, it's the incentive for reporting the posterior, which either minus epsilon or plus epsilon, if you look at this V-shaped rule, that's going to be always plus epsilon, right? Um, whereas the, the mean is one half, uh, and that gives you zero. Okay, so you're comparing zero versus epsilon, and so that gives you the optimal objective of epsilon. 
Um, but if you plug this into a quadratic rule, then your objective, uh, you, you're getting epsilon squared. Okay, and so, you know, the quadratic scoring rule in this regard is unboundedly bad. Uh, first of all, epsilon. Uh, and, okay, so you should take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. It's unboundedly bad, unboundedly bad for small epsilon, but arguably when epsilon is small, I can't get any incentive anyway, so maybe I don't care about the case where it's undoubtedly bad. Okay, so that's like a little grain of salt, but, it, you know, but uh, somehow it's not doing as well as the optimal rule. Okay, and um, uh, in fact, uh, the quadratic mean is uh, closely tied to the, the variance of the distribution, and you can show that um, uh, for any distribution uh, with variance sigma squared, that the quadratic uh, scoring rule is going to be a one over a sigma squared approximation, a sigma, uh, the standard deviation approximation. And this is between zero and one. Okay, so one over uh, sigma is gonna be a number bigger than one for the approximation. Okay, so the smaller the variance, the worse approximation quadratic is. Which actually makes a lot of sense, okay? So the, the less signal is in your posterior, the harder it is for a scoring rule to do anything good at all. Okay, and the quadratic is really badly hurt by this. And so it's approximation factor degrades with how little the information is. Okay, so when you have very little information, you really want to avoid the quadratic rule because you're losing a lot in that case. Well, when epsilon is small, the quadratic rule is really a flat rule. I mean, it's essentially of any, in, in some sense, if you take any differentiable function, uh, when when everything happens very, very close to the, to the, um, to mu, mu, mu d, I mean, it's almost like the function is almost flat, which means you don't, you don't get any separation, you don't get anything. Yeah, uh, and, so you, don't, and, and you do not want differentiable functions. You do want the indeed functions that have uh, that have a king. Exactly, exactly. And you, so you want a function it's with not, a king. It's, not just, what it's we... not just a quadratic that is bad. Anything that is differentiable is not going to work once epsilon is small. That's a great point. Awesome. Yeah, we really want a king. Yeah, because otherwise it's a flat. Uh, differentiable functions are flat uh, locally. Cool. All right. Uh, so I want to. I'm going to move on to multi-dimensional scoring rules. Uh, so uh, my warm-up is going to be center symmetric distribution. So imagine the posterior distribution of means is center symmetric. Okay. So I'm going to draw pictures in two-dimensional space. That's easier. But what center symmetric means is if you look at this diagonal line here that goes through the center of the distribution. Um, what this means is the, the density of the posterior mean is symmetric about uh, you know, either side of that line. Okay, that's what center symmetric means. Okay, and so if we're looking at um, zero, one to the end, then the centers are gonna be at one half. Um, okay, and so you can define a uh, symmetric V-shaped rule, uh, the very natural way uh, for center symmetric, it's just basically in every dimension, it's gonna be V-shaped in that dimension. Um, and we'll define it to have boundary one half and uh, look like this. Okay, uh, but in what do you mean dimensions. by center symmetric again? Yeah, center symmetric means if you look at the distribution of our posterior means and you look at any line through the center, the distribution on the above the line and below the line is the same as, as you go away from the center. When you reflect okay. the points through the center, you get exactly the same probability. Yeah. But okay. now when, when you do uh, n dimension there are, there are uh, there are two ways to do it. One is indeed to do it in each coordinate separately. The other is to take a, a, a cone that in every direction gives you that, that picture. That's not the same. It is the same actually, because the uh, rectangular boundaries are a uh, rectangle. Uh, I, I thought one of them has four walls, the other is round. 
No. The one is, uh, it is, would only uh, be round. It only be round if your boundary was round. Oh, I see. Is square. The boundary, okay, okay, I guess because the boundary is a square and not a circle. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. So it's going to be an upside down pyramid. Uh, all right. Um, and so this is actually fairly straightforward to show. Any symmetric distribution, the optimal solution for it is symmetric, obviously. Um, uh, sorry, the optimal solution is symmetric V-shaped. Um, and one way to see this is if you project onto any of these, if you, proje if you project onto this line and solve the problem, it'll be V-shaped. Like if someone told you it was going to be there, then it would be V-shaped, right? Now you do this for all the lines and the answer is V-shaped everywhere. And it's because all you need to do is know the mean. You don't care about the actual shape of the distribution. Otherwise, that you end up getting this, this very simple result. OK. Um, and one thing that's really, I, I think, really quite nice is that um, uh, one way to uh, implement this V-shaped rule, you think about this upside down pyramid, which is like a bunch of different hyperplanes that come in at this point, right? And so really what matters is which hyperplane you're on. And which hyperplane you're on is the one that's sort of uh, the most interesting dimension, the one where your score is going to be the highest. OK, because you're the, you're the space above these hyperplanes. And so the hyperplane on which your score is the highest is the one that that's the face you're on. OK, and so you can implement this by have the agent choose which dimension gives them the highest expected reward and have them only report in that dimension. OK, so if you think about this for scoring rules, you say, oh, read this submission. There are all these possible mistakes that someone could make. Uh, and report the most surprising mistake that you see. And that's sort of an optimal uh, multidimensional scoring rule, if it's symmetric. Um, cool. So. For multidimensional scoring rules, we can generalize this. So the max of, over separate scoring rules is the following. So imagine there are a bunch of uh, single dimensional scoring rules. Uh, and I define the max over separate to be, um, I take the index i that has the highest utility when I project into utility space. Um, and I design the scoring rule for that report uh, to be, uh, to be um, giving you the score according to that scoring rule. OK, so this is the max over separate scoring rules. OK, and for each dimension i, I need the scoring rule to be proper and bounded. OK, and as I said before, you know, one way to implement this is the choose and report. So the agent chooses which dimension they want to report on, and then they just get scored against the scoring rule for that dimension. OK, um, cool. Uh, a separate scoring rule uh, is a scoring rule where the total score is just given by summing all of uh, single dimensional scoring rules. And this is probably what you've done if you've ever given an exam before. You just ask people to answer the questions, and you just sum the grades across all the questions to get the total grade. Uh, and uh, the you know, a simple approximation bound you can show for this is that these can be as bad as a linear approximation. Um, and one way to think about this is, well, actually, in terms of incentivizing effort, you could just ask one question it, 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 versus asking the average over a bunch of questions. It's the same incentive. Um, and then you don't get any of the benefit that we get from the max over separate rule of basically linking decisions. OK, the, I'm not going to have time for any details uh, beyond what I've already done. Um, but the max over separate rule is an eight approximation. Um, and uh, the, to give you some intuition for the proof of this, the proof is basically by taking the distribution, symmetric, making it symmetric by, by you know, flipping it about its origin. Solving the problem on this flipped space, 
And then observing, you basically lose a factor of two from that flip, right? And then you also lose a factor of two from the fact that the space is now twice as big as it was before. Um, and so you lose a couple factors of two here and there, you end up losing a, a total of eight. Um, but it's basically this flipping the space, solving the symmetric version on the flip space where the symmetric is optimal, and then asking what is this, uh, what is this solution? You know, how is this solution good on the original space? So what I'd see is in the, in the symmetric case, you really care only about one coordinate. Otherwise, somehow you get some power of n in, inside that. The fact that the, for the symmetric, you get this very neat uh, characterization that only one dimension matters is probably why you get the constant here. And n doesn't enter. That's a good observation. I really like that. Interesting. Um, I guess the, the thing I would say is that when we try to show an approximation, so I'm not talking about the optimal objective value. I'm trying, I'm talking about a, it's approximation versus optimal. Okay. And for general distributions, it, you know, the optimal rule is going to be complicated, uh, as you know, Sergio. <laughs> um, and this says that something simple is actually pretty good. And, it, and, uh, I guess the point is once I symmetrize things, then, uh, this simple symmetric result uh, is gives you the answer. Yeah, I mean, it's still the fact that n doesn't end there is still something, uh, you know, it's noticeable. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Anyway, this observation that you can do much better than the separate scoring is, I think, it has nice uh, analogies to the Jackson Sunshine uh, linking decisions idea that even if these are really independent draws on separate distributions, you still want to link the decisions between the uh, uh, across the different uh, dimensions uh, to get the optimal scoring rule. I'm um, cool. So let me wrap up uh, and keep this keep this on time. Um, so uh, we built on a lot of really excellent theory on characterizing scoring rules. Um, we had to do a little bit more because we we're optimizing scoring rules and, and some of the existing definitions didn't satisfy, didn't, didn't work in the extreme cases. So we had to actually add a little bit to them to, because we were getting outside of the cases they covered. Um, there's a really nice old paper by Ossivand about uh, maximizing effort, but restricting attention to only quadratic rules. Um, and in this in this uh, setting, the agent has a cost, and you want to get the agent to put in the most effort uh, given their cost. Um, there's also uh, independent uh, a paper um, uh, that uh, is looking at, at maximizing effort in a binary state model with costly samples, and so you can draw Bern uh, basically Bernoulli samples as much as you want, but you pay a cost for each one, uh, and then you want to maximize effort in, in this model. Um, that's a, this is a, a much more technically difficult framework than, than ours. One of the things I like about uh, our model is that uh, we get uh, single dimensional, we get multi-dimensional, we get sample complexity results. We have, uh, we have, if you look in the paper, a prior independent result um, and, and other stuff like this. And it, it seems like this is a very general framework, which is uh, uh, has a lot of uh, potential applications. Is this paper, the Neyman paper, the Neyman et al. paper is also within the framework of scoring rules? Uh, can you ask the last bit again? The Neyman et al. paper that you just mentioned, is it also within the framework of uh, scoring rules? Uh, yeah, so they're optimizing a scoring rule. Um, but the agent uh, has a um, integer level of effort rather than a binary level of effort. And the integer level of effort corresponds to how many draws from the uh, distribution they sample from. It's basically a question about sampling. Okay, and um, since we uh, worked on this, there have been uh, a number of uh, papers following up this idea of looking at scoring rules that optimize effort. Um, uh, and uh, the, the one by uh, Chen and Yu, for example, um, 
Yu Ching Kong has a really nice uh, paper on peer prediction, uh, bringing this idea of optimizing effort for peer predictors in. Um, and uh, we have a, are working on follow-up uh, paper that is about multi-dimensional effort. And so again, this paper that I'm talking about right now is binary effort. I put in binary effort, I either you know, get a signal or I don't. And the signal tells me something about multi-dimensional state, which you might think is a little bit weird. Why, why can't I individually put in effort on each dimension? And so that's what this, this uh, uh, subsequent paper is doing. Cool, thanks so much for uh, the attention.